You are good, you are kind, you are more than this. Lost for words, trying to describe you. Elohim, Elelion, Ale Shelewi. Your great names is all I see. There is nothing you cannot do. There's no mountain you cannot move. If you are said it, and you will do it. You have a track record of keeping your word and then you're about to stop doing it now oh lord walk by you you are mighty oh oh lord walk by you you are mighty oh shall be all of all you are wrong Somebody raise your hands to the God who is mighty in this place this morning. Mighty to save, mighty to deliver. Somebody raise your hands and say, Lord, you are mighty. Yes, you are mighty. Yes, you are mighty. You are mighty to save. You are mighty to heal. You are mighty. By the blood of the Lamb, we have overcome. The stars that are created for life <laughs> Can you call us into your holy day The center of refuge and strength hey! There is nothing you cannot do There is no boundaries you cannot change if you have said it, oh, and you will do it. You have a track record of keeping your word. You're not about. You're not about to stop doing it. Raise your hand, everybody. Oh, Lord, why cry you? You are mighty, oh. Oh, Lord, why cry you? You are my 
Say this morning, you are mighty. You're mighty to say. With your two wings lifted up to heaven, you are mighty. Everybody, you are mighty. You are mighty. Just go ahead and acknowledge the almightiness of God. Go ahead and, and acknowledge that He is almighty.
is almighty God. There is none that is like him. He is above everything else. Acknowledge his almightiness this morning. Worship him. He's greater than all the things that afflict us at this moment. He's greater than our problems. He's greater than the trials we face as a nation at this time. Worship Him. Yes, Lord, you are almighty. We worship you, Lord. Kabi osio ozana o. Just take it slowly. Hey Jesus Christ, oh I go. Kabi e, kabi osio ozana. Eternal Rock of Ages, we thank you so much. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you are to us. We thank you because you are Almighty God. You are Almighty God. You are Almighty God. You are the one in whom there is no shadow of turning, there is no variableness. When you speak, you bring to pass what you say. You are the equipment. You are the one who, oh God, does not double in on truth. You are truth personified. Lord, we can trust you, irrespective of what is happening around us. Thank you because though we face many battles in life, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty true God in the pulling down of strongholds. We cast down every argument, every imagination that exalts itself against the word of God and the knowledge of God. This morning, we cast down every imagination in our heart, every argument, every reasoning that does not align with our knowledge of God. And we declare that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord in our lives. Jesus is Lord in our church. Jesus is Lord in Nigeria. We do not look at the things that we see. 
we do not cast our hearts and our minds on the things that we see for the things that are visible to our physical eyes they are temporary but Lord the things we do not see that can only be seen with the spiritual eyes they are of eternal nature and so we align with what you have said in your word that is spiritual that Lord you have made us more than overcomers you have made us more than conquerors and so we declare Lord God that we are victors in Christ Jesus that the Egyptians that we see today we will see them no more in the name of Jesus we thank you father that as we come to you in repentance in asking for mercy and oh God confessing the sins of this nation before you the Lord we are sorry where we ought to have acted we have not acted where we ought to oh God not to act we have acted the Lord you have mercy on us the church of God in this nation that Lord on account of us oh God you will have mercy on this nation your word, O oh God, says, when Abraham was pleading, he said, will you for the sake of ten? Lord, there are more, we believe, more than ten, O oh God, more than ten people in this nation that are righteous, more than fifty. On account of this ten, on account of this fifty, on account of this hundred, save this nation, deliver this nation. Lord, we pray that, Father, you will put a stop to the bloodshed in this nation. Lord, we take the offense back to the enemy. And Lord, we pray even in our language. The Bible says that, Lord, you will build your church. And the gates of hell shall not, oh God, overcome your church. They will not withstand the onslaught of your church. So we pray this morning. Make up a sokopo, rukoba, sekepo. Mindalaba seke pro ma seke pro linda la bro zonto lo pre rika ba zuko pre linda la bro mansa kante le bro we release oh God spiritual armory oh God against the enemy forces masaka po ravaging our lands maseke po robo zeke pro masaka pro ba linda la pro maseke pro minda la bro zoko pre maseke pro makante le bro ruske pro mante le bro ruske pro Rukaba zeke pro, luke pro masaka pro, linta la bro zoko pro makandele bo, linseke pro maseke pro matalaba. And we pray, the Lord for all those who mourn in Zion, you will give them the oil of gladness in the name of Jesus. We pray for all those who mourn, oh God, in Zion, you will give them the oil of gladness. You will anoint them with the oil of gladness. We pray, oh God, for our Father and the Lord, the General Vasya, his wife and the entire family. Lord, anoint them with the oil of gladness. Anoint them with the oil of gladness. Anoint them with the oil of gladness in the name of Jesus. And precious Holy Spirit, please speak to us again this morning. Prepare the hearts of everyone here, Lord. Let their hearts, O oh God, be at full attention to your word. We arrest wandering hearts and wandering minds. We speak to your spirit. We say, be still in the name of Jesus. Let your mind be still. Lord, explain your word to your people today. We thank you in advance for what you will do. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Please take your seat. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. The title of the series we will start this morning is titled The Battles of Life and the scripture that we will be taking as our main text is from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read from verse 1 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read from verse 1 to 6. Now the scripture says, now I, Paul, myself, I'm pleading with you, so open your Bible. Don't just look at me. You're supposed to come to church with your Bible. Open your Bibles. This is the, so when the screen is not working, we don't know how to open our Bibles. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Whether you are using a phone or you are using a, a Bible, open, don't look at me. If you don't have your Bible, go and share with somebody. Of course, I know you're supposed to keep your distance. Are we all there? Are you there? Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
reading from verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am bold towards you. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence, by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. As I reflected on this, this topic, the the initial topic that I wanted to title this, and we'll still take it, perhaps we'll deal with that in our digging deep, is the, the mind as your battlefield, the battlefield of the mind. I know we've, we've, we've heard sermons around this, we've, we've thought about this, we've reflected this, but the happenings in our environment today brings this very much to the fore. Many of us Christians, we've... Uh, ask questions about what is going on in the world, what's going on in our country. We have asked ourselves, what can I do about these problems that are so widespread and serious these days? How helpful can I be? You know, there are two extremes people take. Sometimes some become extremists. They begin to use worldly methods. Go to Facebook today. Even Christians are involved in speaking nonsense of what they don't know about and they are writing things they don't know about. They are giving advice of what they have never experienced. Some are even saying, let's go to war. And when they come face to face to war, they will chicken out. So we go to that extreme. The second extreme that we go off to is where like the proverbial ostrich, we put our head in the sand, we pretend that all is well. And we use the scripture, it is well. Of course, that's a prophecy. That's a, a word, it is well. But that does not deny the reality that we are faced, or should not deny the reality that we are faced with serious things today. So you don't hide your head in the sand. You do not go to the extreme. And so what do you do? The, the proper perspective is what we begin to look at today as Christians. God expects us to use this great mind that he has given to us. And so... Today we'll have an excursion into some very deep topics. And unfortunately, many of us are so shallow, we, we're looking for Christianity of claim it and receive it. And as you know, that's not what we talk about here. We claim, we can claim and receive it. But we want you to be able to use your mind, the mind that God has given to you to interrogate the scriptures, to look at what the scripture says and apply the scripture to your day-to-day -day life. The scripture has an answer to the day-to-day -day problems of life that you face. But we want simplistic answer. That's why we're not able to handle effectively the battles of life. And hopefully you will follow this. And some of these messages, you need to listen to it over and over again. I want to ask, tell you up front, if you are in this church, you do not make notes when you are hearing the word, or you don't go back to listen to these messages, you are cheating yourself. By the grace of God, we've preached several messages here that should transform your life. But you clap, you, you, you say what a sound message. But how much of it has affected you? How much of it has changed your mind? On Tuesday, two weeks ago, we talked about worldview. How much of your worldview has been changed by the messages that you hear? You are cheating yourself. This is a season that you are in. The time is coming when you will not have access to this kind of knowledge. God will send you somewhere. And then there will be a drought. And then you will say, I wish I had listened to these things then. I implore you, by the mercies of God, get the CDs, get the tapes, whatever it is that you need to get. Ask them to give you a download. Listen to them over and over again. And this particular message this morning that we will be discussing is one that you need to listen deeply because it helps you to put things in context about what is happening around us today. The scripture has an answer to the questions of life. They provide guidance to the problems that pursue us on every side. And we've read the scripture that we're going to focus on in the next few weeks as the Lord will allow us, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. And so, 
the, the Apostle Paul introduces the theme, the central theme of this particular scripture from verses 1 to 4. And the background of this scripture is the challenge that the Corinthians are posing to the authority of Paul as an apostle. Paul is being challenged by them. There were some among the Corinthians who were trying to undermine the impact of Paul's words, both when he writes letters to them and when he preaches to them. When they received the letters from Paul, some of the Corinthians were angered by the letters of Paul, the words of Paul, and they resisted strongly what Paul had to say. Specifically, as this passage revealed, certain Christians in Corinth were saying that Paul was essentially not different from anyone else. They said his apostleship did not, did not put upon him any special right to speak with authority more than anyone else. And they alleged wrongly that his motivations were essentially the same as other people. That Paul was out to get whatever he wanted by the way that he was carrying out his work. But Paul powerfully and rightly so says and speaks against these allegations. And he says in another translation, he says, this is not the case. You Corinthians are quite wrong. You have failed to recognize the fundamental change which occurs in a Christian. When a man becomes a Christian, something fundamental, something absolutely radical occurs in him so that he cannot continue to see things as he once did. And that's what I'm challenging all of us. If we say we are Christians, we should not see the things, see life as others do. There must be a way that we see life that is different from others. And he further says, Paul furthermore says, you do not understand the radical difference with which an apostle who is by virtue of his office, a model Christian, a pattern for others must face life. If you think that I act like other people, that my motives, my purposes and goals are no different than ordinary men and women, Paul says to them, you have fundamentally misunderstood the whole matter. That's a translation that puts in context verses, the, the first few verses. And then Paul goes on to then say to them in verses 3 and 4, he says, though we live in the world, we are not carrying out worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Paul is also declaring, in a sense, the fundamental tension in which a Christian lives. We are in the world, the Bible says, but we are not of the world. And many of us Christians don't understand this. And we, again, come to two extremes. There are those who believe that because the Bible says we are not of this world, but that we should then live the life of a hermit. We, we want to go to a place where there are no pollutions, where there are no influences, and we go to the monasteries. Gone are the days of monasteries. You are in the world, and you must live in the world, and you must be subject to the influences of the world. But the Bible says you are not of the world because your reaction must not be the way the world reacts. And that's the tension that we have as Christians. We are in the world, but the Bible expects us that we must not live as people in the world. That tension will always be there. And sometimes we fail, we fall. But there is the support that the scripture offers us. And so we, we do not live, we do not fight on the terms of the world. We are not carrying out a worldly war. And it might be helpful to review, you know, the, that scripture in other translations, in, in other translations, it says, for though we live in the world, we are not carrying on a worldly war, for the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And so as we go through this series, we, we see, we will see, and we will discuss how a Christian should react to the social ills and injustices of our days. And there has never been a time when the disorders of society was more spread. They, they press on us everywhere we turn and we cannot escape them. We therefore need to find an answer to the scriptures. I've taken much reflection 
And each time the Lord presents a topic to me, I go look at what have people said about these things that is scriptural? What have other, other preachers said? And what does the scripture say? And having done that, I present to you what I consider to be a balanced view that you can practically live. And as we follow this, you see a practical expression of how we as Christians ought to respond to the societal pressures and ills that we face today. In this passage we've just read, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4. Let me repeat it to you so that this passage will be ingrained in your spirit, man. It says, for though we live in the world, okay, uh, let's look at the King James Version. Okay, give it to me. For though we walk in the flesh, okay, the flesh is synonymous of the world. For though we live in the world, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We do not carry out our warfare. We do not live our lives after the manner of the world. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We will examine what Paul refers to as strongholds shortly. In this passage, two things become very, very evident. Two things. One is that we cannot and we must not ignore the problems that hit us on every side in society. We live in the world like I've just said. We must not try to evade these problems. We must not try to ignore them. We must not feel that we are not affected, that you live in one gated building or one gated estate and you feel it doesn't touch you. The answers protest showed us that nowhere is safe to some of these things that are happening to us. So you cannot afford to ignore them. You cannot afford. That's one. People in Abuja now are trembling because of a lot of things, the, the incursion, and those of us in Lagos who thought that we were safe, of many of the things that are happening, we are beginning to, to shiver. So we must not run away from life. It is unchristianly to run away from the problems of life. It is unchristianly to seek a shelter where we can live without encountering the difficulties around us. This was not the example that Jesus set for us. Jesus lived his life squarely in the middle of life. He lived fully. He associated with the afflictions of those around him, the grievous problems emotionally, physically, and every other thing that happened to people. And this is where we Christians must live. We must not adopt the head in the sand attitude where we, we, we feel that by ignoring them, they will go away. You know, in the gospel, we remember the words concerning the Lord Jesus, that he looked upon the multitudes with compassion. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Matthew 9, 36, and he saw them as sheep not having a shepherd. They were wandering about without help or guidance in the midst of very confusing problems. That's what the world faces today. And we who have the truth, we must be able to speak truth to them and give guidance to those who are confused. When we are confused like them, then where will help come from? And that's what this hopes to give to us today so that we can know how to handle them. The second thing, so the first thing is we must not ignore the problem. The second thing that this passage tells us is that we must not and we do not attack these social problems the way the world does. We must not. The apostle says we live in the world but the weapons of our warfare are not worldly. We do not face life the same way. We fight in another dimension. And yet our fighting is not weak. It is powerful. It wins. It succeeds. It is mighty. And Paul says something of the nature of these problems. He calls them strongholds. He calls them strongholds. And strongholds are places and situations where evil is entrenched. Where evil cannot easily be dislodged. Where evil is powerfully defended. As you listen to these descriptions, I guess many things come to mind about our country today. Where it seems that certain things have become so entrenched that they cannot be dislodged. There are many of such in our day. They are bound around us. And many have become issues that the world is struggling with today. So let's, let's, let's I invite you to, to, to look at the scriptures so we learn a little bit more about the nature of these problems. Paul, speaking again in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 5, he says about these problems, these, these strongholds, he says, we destroy arguments 
and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. Every thought captive to obey Christ. You may need to read some of these scriptures in other translations so you understand what it says. It says we destroy argument. So there are two things again that become evident from this particular verse 5. Number one, the source of the enemy's strength. Everybody say the source of the enemy's strength. And then he then talks about the nature of the Christian's attack, the nature of the attack of the Christian. For today, we will consider ourselves with the first of these two, which is the source of the enemy's strength. And that's where we will dwell on for the rest of this message. And so, one of the chief rules of, warf of warfare is to know your enemy. You can never be successful as a soldier if you do not know something about the tactics. When I say your enemy, I'm not saying now that you go and be studying demonology. We have, if you notice in this church, I do not preach about demons. You know, it is said that when you want to differentiate about, I was told many years ago, if you want to differentiate between fake currency and, uh, and correct currency, that those who deal in currency, they are taught every feature of the, of the genuine currency. Because the fake one can come in many ways. Don't focus on the fake. Focus on the genuine. So that when the fake one comes, you say, ah, I know the genuine one, so you are fake. Do you understand me? Are you with me? So you must know about your life of faith. You must know about Jesus. You must know about the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit. So that when the work of demons come, you will differentiate between the work of demons and the work of the Holy Spirit. But there are so many people that specialize in demonology. Knowing the names of demons. Knowing how demons, I don't have any problem with that. But I chose to depend and, and focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. So that when the demons come and they want to afflict me with lies, I will say, no, this one cannot be the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? I decide, I, I, I decide to focus on the Holy Spirit. That's why when I hear some people say something, I say, this cannot be God. This cannot be Holy Spirit. I do not care the name of the, of the demon, but I care about what the Holy Spirit does. So, so we need to understand the, the tactics. What we focus on is the tactics. How does the enemy act so knowing the tactics is important and so that's what we will take some time to look at and understand know your enemy and know the tactics of your enemy and the other thing is you also may know you also need to know the nature of your own weapons so the first issue is what makes this stronghold so strong what makes them so strong you know, we, the Bible refers to these problems as strongholds. What makes them so strong? Where does the enemy derive the strength that enables him to remain entrenched in human society? Why is it so difficult to eradicate these pockets of evil from our social structures? Why do they defy the attempts that are made by sincere men and women that we see recorded in the, in the newspapers week after week, the meetings, the collaborations, the, the various things that are done. Why are these evils so hard to remove or dislodge? Examples of these evils in our day today we see is the issue of, of drugs and, and access to drugs. It looks like the more we fight drugs, the more they become endemic in our society. Why is drug consumption and drug trafficking so hard to dislodge and eliminate amongst our people? Why do they seem to resist such efforts? Why can't people see the terrible effects of becoming involved with all these mind-altering drugs? As some of you may know, I belong to the board of the CADAM, and CADAM is Christ Against Drug Abuse Ministry. A few weeks ago, uh, we had the graduation ceremony of the of the of the organization and i was invited to speak and, and deliver the message and you if you were there you weep handsome beautiful well-educated people graduates they were there they were people that had been afflicted with drugs and they were there husbands of of girls that ought to have been married wives of men that ought to have been married the devil afflicted them but glory be to God for Kadam that God used to, to rehabilitate them. And they are sending them back to society. And we offer the prayer that they will not return. Amen. Say better amen. amen. 
children of the high and mighty, children of the low. It doesn't respect social strata. It afflicts everyone. Why is it so hard? Why are people focused on, on marijuana? You see, a lot of countries today have legalized marijuana and people are beginning to consume them like other things. And they say, well, it has, there's medical marijuana. There's medical marijuana, but, but, but what of the other side of it? Who gave you license to begin to consume? But that's a different thing. And so what makes all these things endemic? Why is it that the application of sound and good common sense principles do not resolve these things? Why? And then I want to touch on an area that may be very touchy, but I will say it boldly because I've been called to speak boldly. Another endemic issue in our country today and in other parts of the world, in other parts of the world, is racism. Racism. Black upon white, white upon black racism and reverse racism, which is blacks also becoming racist. And in our country, it's ethnicity. Why is ethnic chauvinism so rampant in our nation today? Why? Why is it so explosive? This is an area that has fired up a lot of violence. There's a, there's a particular group, chat group of Christians. And somebody wrote and said, let's go our ways. Let your robbers form Oduduwa Republic. Now I'm not preaching whatever here. And then one man was so angry, one pastor. He says, you guys, you, you don't know what you're talking. Christians? He says, my wife is Yoruba. I'm, uh, I'm from Edo. Uh, so if you say we should go our ways, where would we go? He was so angry. And so we must tread carefully. Christians must be careful in their pronouncement. Who is behind all this? What are their motives? Have you checked the lives of those who are talking about these things? Have you gone to see them? When people are dying on behalf of movements that they don't know the, the motives of those behind them, I pity you, they die useless death in my own opinion. You may not like what I'm saying, but I'm saying the truth this morning. The, what is the, why is ethnicity so difficult to address? We must ask these deep questions if we are to understand the enemy that is attacking us. And we must attack these issues as Christians who are living in the world. And the world is the way it is because of certain factors that are at loose. I may take a little bit more time this morning, so permit me. And if you think that the Bible, the Bible has no relevance to life, then you are mistaken. Suicide is also another issue that is on the rampage. Why is this so? Why are people taking their lives? Why do they suddenly come to a place where they feel that everything is hopeless? From when does this thing, or when, where, from where do these things derive their strength? Such defiant persistence. The answer lies in the two elements which Paul describes for us in verse 5. Two elements. And these are always present in any problem where evil is at work. Whether it is in the life of the individual or whether it is in the life of a society. And the Bible speaks to the individual most times. But you know, society is a collection of individuals. And so the same principle that the Bible advocates for solving the problem at the individual level is also applicable for solving the problem at societal level. What, has this, what are these two elements that we're talking about? Or the pillars of strength of evil? And Paul, first of all, says, Apostle Paul, he calls them arguments. Everybody say arguments. Arguments. A writer says that the Greek translation of argument is, is logismos. It's logismos. And it means reasonings. Arguments. Reasonings. Reasonings. That's the first. The second strength of evil is what the Bible calls every proud obstacle. And so the second pillar of evil is pride. Everybody say pride. And, and, and pride is described when it says that every high thing, in verse 5, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. It's the same principle. It's the same principle. The serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say? God did not say that you will die. God knows that when you eat this apple, you will, you will have knowledge. You'll be as wise as God. Pride. Pride. Look at every evil today. Can you not see that ethnic chauvinism at the, at the bottom of it, ethnicity at the bottom of it is pride. My tribe is better than your tribe. My tribe is more endowed than your tribe. Think about it. 
the Fulani hegemony that is spreading around. Hey, we, are, we are the ones that are born to rule. Yoruba secessionists. Oh, we, we, have, we, have, uh, we have resources, so we will go. I mark you. The macro units will separate. And somebody wrote a brilliant article. He says, who says that when, when the larger regions separate, that there will not be ethnicity in each of the regional elements? Who says so? Who says that the Jebus will not uh, begin to attack Ekitis? Who says so? Who says so? The Jebus will say, I'm more superior. Ekitis will say, we go to school more than you. Who says that that will not happen? So where will it learn? Where will it end? At what level will the division stop? Again, please note, I'm not preaching politics. I'm trying to let you know that the solution to societal problem does not lie with the kind of weapons that we are fighting with. Hello? If you want to know my political leanings, let's have a conversation outside of a pulpit. I will not turn the pulpit into a political platform. So that's what we're saying. So pride, at the height of every problem, is pride. That is where evil derives its strength. And you know, there's a relationship between these two. Relationship between reasonings, arguments, and pride. And the relationship is this. You don't see pride sometimes. You cannot know whether somebody is proud. Pride is only exemplified, is only shown by either the behavior of the person or the words of the person. So there is a connection. It starts from the heart, pride, and then it manifests as behavior or it manifests as arguments or as reasonings. And that's why we cannot get anywhere to solving this problem by all the efforts that man has made. And this is what men do not see. We all have sincere desire to solve this, but we do not understand that even the very, very attempt to solve these problems are mad, are, are affected by the same evil. Christians, even when they approach problems in the same way, we find that we are afflicted by the same weakness. Let us take a closer look at these points, at these strengths. Let's take the issue of reasoning or argument. I'll try to move a little bit faster now. You know, one writer was talking about when a movement starts, when something starts. Most movements in society, most attempts to change something in society always start from the realm of the emotional. Somebody is angered by something and then they say, we must change it. And then if you address it at that level, at that time, you may, you may succeed in changing it. Most things start at that level. And so, but after some time, they sit down and they begin to rationalize their emotional outburst. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, I was reading. In the 1960s, even the American Medical Association wrote in their book that, that homosexuality was a, was a disease, was something that was a mental problem. But of course, those who were involved in it, they had a long-term strategy of changing the minds. Another message I'll preach to us, maybe on Tuesday, is that we all are involved in a mind game. You are involved in a mind game. You are involved in a mind game. I'll tell you something. You all know that I was wearing, I was wearing bears, and I said I wanted to associate with the youths. Recently, I came, I don't know how far it's true, but I tend to believe it. And so I decided, you know what, I will not allow anyone to play mind game on me. So I went to shave off my beards. I'll tell you why. I don't know how far it's true. I was having a, an intellectual conversation with, with a newspaper editor, and this was what came out of that. And we're talking about the mind games that, that journalists play, the mind games that the media is playing. All of us are being, being, our minds are being affected by the games the media is playing. You think that the news you hear is the news. They are manipulating you. The newspaper editors, they know what they are putting across. They want to put across the opinion of one, but they say, uh, uh, they say uh, what they say, information reaching us says that. There are, most stories in newspapers are planted stories. Brother Benidu, I know you, is it Brother Benidu here? I, I know you will not agree, but they are planted stories. Brother Benidu, are you here? Uh -huh. 
they are, the, the purpose of any media organization is to change your mind. So the story was, many years ago, it was, it was becoming difficult for these people, those, those people from the other religion who wear beards and long, when they, they were being profiled because of their beards. When they go to custom places and all that, especially in Western countries, their beards give them out as to what their religion is. And I heard, I cannot say it's true, I heard that beyond advocacy at national level, they decided to do something. And that's what the so-called social media influencers in this nation are doing. They began to speak and pump money to global influencers. Those global influencers began to wear beards. And when they began to wear their own beards, because youths also are easily influenced, the youths thought it was the hip thing, the in thing to wear beards. People wear beards because of other reasons. But this was a strategy. And very soon, everybody, high, low, mighty, were wearing beards. So when you get to the customs point, it's no longer a case of your beard. I see some people wear beards today. They are not people of the other religion, but their beards are even longer than the people of the other religion. And so gradually, the whole world has been changed mentally. I said I would not be a victim of this. I've shaved off my beards. Praise the Lord. It's a mind game. I'd like you to go and read this book. There's a book that a Nobel Prize, Prize winner wrote. It's called Nudge. They are using this system even at the highest level of public policy. In the United Kingdom, it's a, it's a, it's a field of study. It's called behavioral, behavioral science, behavioral economics, behavioral science. You can write it down. There's a book, Nudge. You can get the... Those of, if you don't know how to read serious books, don't bother, okay? But if you can read it, go. N-U-D-G-E, nudge. People like Brother Edbenidu who run uh, advertising companies, it's, that, it's this, that's the science they use, so I'm telling you their secret. They, that's the science. What do they do? Their campaigns are made to change your behavior. A man won a Nobel Prize by writing about that. And so governments, if they want you to pay more tax, there's a way they will do that. Once upon a time, they said milk was not good. Then they said milk is good. And then where do we stay? And then money is pumped into those media campaigns. It's the same tactics that the enemy is using. That's the point I'm making in all this. Read that book, Nudge, is the use of, and it can be helpful to you. Now, in all these things, there's the good and the bad aspects of it. Let me try and see if I can hurry up this and, and, and begin to wrap it up. So, the, the, if you notice in the Garden of Eden, Eve stood before the luscious, desirable fruit and um, it appealed to her senses. It appealed to everything about her. That's phase one, appealing to the emotional. It arose her desire. As she stood there looking at the fruit, she wanted to have it. There was a waking in her an urge, an emotional reaction. And then the next stage, was for her to, the next chapter of the book was for her to reason it out. And so she looks at this tantalizing fruit before her. She began to outline in her mind the first chapter of the book in defense of eating the fruit. She then sees, according to her, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6, she began to rationalize it. This was no longer at the level of the emotional. She says, it is good for food, number one. Number two, it's a delight to the eyes. Number three, it is desirable to make one wise. Those are rationalizations. And then, those were the chapters of the book that she ultimately wrote and presented to her husband. And the husband was convinced and he ate with her. And you know the rest of the story. This is what happens today. And so we must look at this closely as Christians. We must understand what these reasonings are, what they essentially are, that these reasonings are a tribute to the importance of our minds as a battlefield of the world today. It's, an, it's a tribute to the intelligence of man. What distinguishes man and animals is that animals refuse 
They don't have a mind of their own, so to say. Animals react emotionally. Animals follow urges. Even though animals can be trained, they follow instincts of their own kind. When an animal acts, an animal is not troubled by his conscience. An animal does not toss and turn all night because he cannot sleep because of what happened during the day. But men do not react that way. There is something about the mind of man that is logical, that is reasonable, that tries to justify every action. It's our mind that prompts our conscience. When something is not right with your mind, your conscience is the barometer that God has put inside of you to help you. But what people do today is to rationalize something so that their conscience can take it. I don't know if you've come across that joke where, where a Jew, you know Jews don't eat pork meat. The Jew, a Jew went to a meat shop. There was this beautiful looking pork meat at the window and he was saying, oh, this, this beef, beef meat looks very nice, very nice. And he was telling himself that pork meat is beef meat. And then somebody said, sorry sir, that's not beef, that's more pork. He looked at him and said, who asked you? He was trying to rationalize to himself that beef, that pork was beef. And you know, there's a way you can tell yourself lies so very much that the lies become truth and then you're able to accept it. That's what's happening with, with homosexualism today where, where they began to rewrite medical history. They began to rewrite it. That you can call yourself any gender. So much confusion in the world today. You say, write and write and she, he, or he, she. What was, what was that? And all kinds of all kinds of confusion that you have thousands of gender descriptions today. That's confusion. But let's go back. So men look for rationalizations. Men begin to look what would make their mind resort to an action that they initially thought was not right. This is what Paul was referring to. And this is where evil derives its strength. Listen. Evil derives its strength by producing false and reasonable sounding arguments which make their ultimate appeal to man's self-sufficiency. Man begins to look at himself as not needing God and then he exalts himself against the knowledge of God that says this is wrong. And these things appeal. Because if it's not wrong, why would any ethnic society kill people, any ethnic, ethnic uh, group kill people for no just reason? Why would human beings slaughter people for no just reason in the name of any, any, any philosophy? It's been happening. Hitler said he was doing the Jews a favor and slaughtered Jews. Racism all over the world today, white on black racism. They say they are superior. And blacks are doing reverse racism again. I spoke about the, what, what men do to women and women do to men. You heard the story, the story, very sad story of the young girl that was lured to, to an interview, supposed interview in, in, um, in Zakwaibom or, or Calabar, yes. And, and the girl was, was, was raped and was, was killed. That's a warning all of you young people here. Be careful where you go to. Talk to people before you go anywhere. I heard the story of a woman who was given a letter of employment in one oil company and she went there and received. Even reading that letter, because I saw it, reading that letter shows thousands of things wrong with that letter. And she went. They collected money from her already. Be careful. There are people on the prowl. Even this issue of bank now. I'm saying how on earth will people still be falling for this, if anybody falls for it here, I'll first of all flog you before I come and reason with you. Because there are some tricks. If somebody calls you and says you give you, you should give him your, your ATM pin on phone, on phone, on phone, your ATM pin. Ah. Or on Facebook, somebody gives you a business proposal. When somebody says he has a business proposal that will give you 100% return in, in, in seven days, you are a thief. If you fall for it, you are a thief. Go and ask questions. Go and ask questions. Go and ask questions. There are parameters that you should look at. Even the Holy Spirit has not spoken to you, say there's something wrong with this. I see them all the time on Facebook, and several people have fallen, fallen for it. 
They say they use juju. Why should juju work on you? That's an aside, so let me, let me move on. So it's all a mind game, mind game, mind game that is going on. And so Paul goes further to call these spirits. He called them doctrines of demons. They are seducing spirits that are using the minds of men as their instruments to present humanity with lies. They are reasonable sounding lies, but they are actually lies. They are not truths. They are false, seductive to lead people astray. They do not educate the mind towards truth, but towards error. When we talk about demonic, do not look at the occult where we talk about outright demonic possessions. Demonic also has to do with wicked spirits in high places, which Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 6 as being our real enemies. He says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He says, but we wrestle against those who are walking through the minds and the thinking of men. How therefore can you explain the evil that keeps cropping up in human society? How do you explain where universities that are supposed to be bastions of knowledge dedicated to the pursuit of truth should become places where evil is deep-seated and where corruption is disseminated? How can you account for this except that Paul has correctly analyzed the situation and that these ideas come not from any other source but from demonic spirits walking through the minds of men, teaching wrong ideas and masquerading them as logical and reasonable. I, I invite you to, to try out this formula on life and see if it fits or not. At the heart of any philosophy, at the heart of any argument is the fact that men try to exalt philosophies against the knowledge of God. That is what Paul is telling us today. If anything is lifting up man as something high and great, if it is lifting up man as something that exalts itself and praises itself, that is the test to see whether it's of God. As many of you know, I, I do a lot, I used to do a lot of facilitation. There's a particular curriculum that I used to teach and that curriculum talks about the fact that you, you, can, you can get to any level. And that's why we must be careful as Christians when you say uh, that there's something in you that you have to look inwards. No, you don't look inwards, you look to God. Okay, it's demonic spirit, demonic, demonic, uh, 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 all these Eastern philosophies that talk about you. The, 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 the stories of uh, people like Anthony Robbins, I'll mention them, Anthony Robbins and all that. A dear, a dear friend of mine, called me and said, Pastor, he was calling me from the U.S. and said, and said Pastor, uh, there's this book, Chicken Soup for the Soul series. How many of us know about this series, Chicken Soup for the Soul series? How many of us have read those? You guys don't read. How about? Those are as old. Anyway, they tell fantastic stories, and the person says, oh, I've been given a license to, to, to begin to teach. I say, hey, hey, watch it. I've read those books. No more of those books. It, as I read them, after some time, my spirit began to... To, 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 to bring out uh, red lights. And then I realized that these guys were teaching Eastern philosophies. Uh, they were teaching um, uh, New Age philosophies. And you have got to be careful. You've got to be careful. So, so anytime I taught that curriculum, I, I introduced the fact that there is a limit to which you as a man can help yourself if God doesn't help you. Are you with me? There's a limit. We invite people to develop their skills. We invite you to use what God has de developed, deposited in you. But do not forget that there is a God factor. So I say it. I say it publicly in those lectures. Because I began to be troubled that I hope I was not teaching Eastern philosophies. And God delivered me from that approach. Praise the Lord. So any philosophy that exalts man over God is demonic in origin. And I've said... Ethnic prejudice, what lies behind it? Whether Fulani versus Yoruba, Yoruba versus Igbo, what lies behind that? You can see that it is a desire for pride, for domination over others, for the exaltation of my group as opposed to someone else's group. Ethnicity, hear me. Ethnic chauvinism, the desire for one ethnic group to dominate another. Quote me 
is always and is clearly a doctrine of demons. Say, Pastor Haba, why would you want... God has not called us to dominate anyone. God has not called us. And so we must be careful. That's why I'm saying we'll begin to see what the solution is. These reasonings, no matter how reasonable the argument may sound in support of them, are revealed as their heart. You know, there's, there's one governor. I don't want to exalt his name. You know, people are so subtle. They pretend as if they are supporting you. And, and they've been saying, some of them, oh, power will come to the south. And, all that. and then somebody says, if you begin to argue and fight, and uh, who will give you power? As if power is given by men. Did you hear that statement? Is power given by men? That shows the pride. The pride that we hold the power and we disseminate it to whoever we, we, we wish. And we have fallen prey to them. We must demolish those arguments in the place of prayers. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What is behind riots, violence today? I've, 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 played, I've played unionism, student unionism in my days. And the student unionism we played was not the destructive kind of unionism. I've been involved in negotiating with, with corporate union officials. And I see that at the heart of many of them is selfishness. Why is it? Why is it? Tell me that NLC says to us, we are mobilizing. We will go. We will go all out. And then when we have all been geared up and all that, at the deep, third moment they say, well, hold on. We have resolved it. Many times, some waters have crossed the bridge. You can't trust them. I've seen them. I've seen people that have been, and that have been so filled with power that when you're trying to bring options, they say, no, it's either my way or the highway. It's demonic spirits that are in charge at that time. When people refuse to be rational, it's demonic spirits. And so the question we will ask me is, how do we address this? And that's what we'll discuss at the next study. But I'd like to summarize it quickly by saying that it is by declaring the truth. The gospel is the truth. It is by, by declaring the truth. Four things. Love, truth, faith, righteousness. Faith goes with prayers. That's why we must never get tired of praying. That's why we must continue to pray. Because there is power in our prayers. The solution, the gospel, the truth, the truth. We must keep declaring the truth. We must keep declaring the truth. The gospel is the truth. We must, we must demonstrate that we are at a higher level. We are at a higher level. We must show that in every area of our lives. Some of the people you are fighting, we say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Sometimes we kill human beings, but it's the spirits, the spirits live on. The spirits take the possession of other people. If you keep killing human beings and don't focus on the spirits that are behind them, the spirits will only use other human beings. That's why some of our strategies are not working today. That's why we as Christians must never get tired of, of, of praying, of, of preaching. And I wish we could understand how great the program that God has put in our hands. It is the only way out. It's the only way out. And this is what, why we gather Sunday after Sunday to celebrate the Lord. This is why we gather at the Lord's table. I pity those of you who don't come for Holy Communion. When we come together for the Holy Communion, what we are saying is that we are expressing our hearts filled with gratitude to God. God who loved us and set us free and then has given us the mandate to go set others free. I love what someone said. He puts it this way. He says evangelism is basically one beggar telling another where he can find bread. We have the bread of life. We know the answers to life's problems and God expects us to tell others. And that's the challenge I throw to us today. That the problems we're faced with, look at how long we've been fighting them. I was listening to Abakoba speak during the platform and he says people talk about constitution. I love his presentation. He says people talk about constitution. That constitution is not the issue. You can write the most beautiful constitution, but if people don't obey it, it is worthless. And he said something that is the union, the fact that people decide. The constitution can serve as a guide. As a son speaking, it's not, it's not me, I'm not, I don't have a degree in law. He says, people focus on the constitution as if that will guarantee anything. Have you not known 
Let me ask you now, have you not seen government, state and federal, disobey court rulings? Have you not seen them? So people say the system, court rulings that are as, 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 as clear as daylight, they disobey them. We need a different approach. And the approach is to identify that at the heart of this problem are number one, reasonings, arguments that are from the pit of hell, and then pride. And in the next meeting, we will begin to discuss how we can demolish them. But meanwhile, if you rise to your feet now, we will just say a few prayers. If you can pray in tongues, pray in tongues. I will just say, Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, the problems that are facing Nigeria, we know now, they are arguments, they are, they are, they are reasonings, and they are pride. Lord, we demolish them in the spirit. Go ahead and pray in tongues. We demolish the arguments, the reasonings. Lord God Almighty, that people has, have elevated. Oh God, we demolish them. We demolish them. Pray, people of God. Pray. If you can't pray in tongues, say, I demolish reasonings and arguments that have been proposed for the problems in Nigeria. I demolish them. In the spirit realm, I demolish them. I stand in my place as a child of God. Praise the Lord. Maybe you are not sure of who you are. So let's take this declaration first of all. Praise the Lord. Let's take this declaration. If you are sure you are born again, say after me. Say, I'm a child of God. I am seated with Jesus in heavenly places. Far above principalities and powers. And every evil that can ever be imagined. In my position with Christ Jesus, I make declarations today concerning Nigeria. And I declare that every argument, every reasoning that have been advanced for the evil that is afflicting Nigeria, I demolish them. Every form of pride that any person or group of persons have, have, have taken up to perpetuate the evil in this nation, we bring them low. We declare, let the Lord humble them in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray those prayers. Liprakadobo son tolo pre ma preyanda la bo zepro makantele bro ruske bro mandele bro zepro mandela bro mandele ske bro mandele bo zepro mandele bro ruske bro mandele bo zepro mandela bro pre 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 liske bro mandele bo zepro mandele bo ruske bro mandele bro mandele bro zepro mandele bro liske bro mandele bo Rindele bo, zepro mandele bo, rebo seke pro, rindala bro, zepro mandele bo, rindale ske bro bo, rindala ske bro bo, ruske bro mandele bo, rindala bo, soko pre mandele bo, riske bro mandele bo, liske bro mandele bro, zentele bro, pray, pray, if you can't pray in tongues, declare, I demolish arguments, I demolish reasonings against the progress of this country, I demolish them. Arguments that have been uh, that have been fashioned against the people of this nation. Arguments that have been fashioned to destroy lives in this nation. We demolish them. We demolish them. We pray that every group, Lord, that have arisen, individuals that have arisen with pride and that have exalted themselves against the word and the knowledge of God, humble them. Humble them. Humble them. Maseke pro mandele bo, ruske bro mandele bo, riske bro mandele bro, rindala bo skendele bro, rundala bro skendele bro, rindala bo sendele bro, mandele bro, rundala skondolo bro, mandele bro sondolo bro, rebro sobro bo mandele bo, pre 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 pre. Zepro mandele bro mandele bo, raska bro mandele bo, ruske bro mandele bo. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. I want us to pray against this evil of of people killing people. Like I said, at the heart of it is reasoning, argument, pride, that the Lord Almighty will nullify the arguments. He will expose these arguments as lies before people. The indoctrination that people have received, the men's, men's heart that have been indoctrinated, that Almighty God will, will unveil the lies to people. 
Let's address the root and say, Father, the lies that men have received, Lord, you, the Bible says, listen, listen, so we can pray intelligently. Listen, listen. Let's learn to pray intelligently. The Bible says the hearts of kings are in the hands of God. And like rivers of running water, he turns them to whatsoever direction he wills. Let's pray that the multitude of people that have been deceived with these reasonings and arguments, that God will change their hearts. God will turn their hearts. That God will reach them and will give them the truth. Expose them to the truth. Go ahead and pray. Liprakado zopro makandelebo. Pray. Riskebro mandelebo. Mandelebro sundolo pray. Mandelebro zopro mandelebo. Riskabra mandelebo. Mandelebro sundolo pray. The thousands and millions of people that have been indoctrinated, the foot soldiers that have been indoctrinated to cause mayhem in this nation. Oh God of heaven, you have their heart in your hands. Lord, turn their hearts, O oh God, to the truth, the truth of your gospel. The truth that says that all men are equal in the eyes of God. The truth that says that it is wrong to kill. Turn their hearts, O oh God, to you. O oh God, save them. Save them by your word, the truth. Lord, deliver them from these doctrines of demons that they have received. We war against, O oh God, even the strongholds in the minds of these people. Lord, we demolish, O oh God, the strongholds in their minds. La capo soco premandelebo. Mandele bro sopro, ring de la bro sopro, mancando le bo, ring de la scam, brande le bo, sopro, mande le bo, rusque bro, mande le bo. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. You know, I said to you that that there are two stages of of movements, of of philosophies. Number one is the emotional phase when people say well, they are charged. Then number two is the phase of of reasonings of of intellectual input, where people begin to form lies. There are people behind these movements. There are leaders behind these movements who are sitting down in pride and saying that taking the place of God and playing chess with the destinies of men. We are going to say, oh God, you said that Heavenly Father, you resist those who are proud. Pull them down. Let them be caught in their own pride. Pull them down. Humble them, Lord. Go ahead and pray. Every man, every woman, every group of people, Lord God Almighty, that have taken positions, oh God, in pride, and they say that they will take the place of God and are playing chess with the destinies of men. Oh God Almighty, fight them yourself. You said you resist the proud. Fight them yourself. Pull them down from their high and lofty places. Let us begin to see their downfall. Oh God of heaven. Heaven, that Lord, their pride will bring them down in the name of Jesus. Lepre candela bro, mindala bro, son tolobre, mandele bro, zopro macandele bro, ruske bro, mandele bo, risca bra mandele bo, marabasaka pro mandele bo. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. I was meant to take a prayer for the nation at the end of the service, but this, this will serve it. Before I close this morning, you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot operate from a position that you don't, you don't have. So, you are here this morning. You are not born again. You are not seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. You are at the low end where elemental spirits will deal with you. You are not born again this morning. You don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. You are not sure that if he comes today, you will be among those who will go with him. I would like to pray with you so that you can be sure this morning. If you would like to take a step and say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I've recognized that I don't know you, but I want to know you. Is there anybody who wants to make that decision this morning? Life is too, is too dangerous to play a guessing game. Is there anybody who wants to be sure this morning? Just wave your hand wherever you are. We would like to pray with you. Upstairs, downstairs, anybody... If you are waving your hand, wave it properly so that you'll see. We'll see. Anybody that wants to say, Jesus, I surrender to you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I have taught you this morning who your enemy is. I've taught you the tactics of the enemy. I've taught you the strength of the, of the enemy. Reasonings, arguments. I'm recruiting you now into the army of the Lord, which you already belong to. To begin to pray for this nation and the world with a different mindset. And that prayer, if you can spend five minutes, I challenge us all. 
I'm not going to do a prayer chain to say, write down your name. We might do that as time goes on, but we live in dangerous times and we must pray. If all of us could spend just five minutes, five minutes, five minutes praying concentrated prayer daily and just making this declaration. If you can pray in tongues, pray in tongues. Five minutes for Nigeria. I'm, I'm, I was going to say 15 minutes, but let's make it slowly, five minutes. Pray in tongues. And as you pray, say, Father, I demolish arguments and reasonings that are behind the problems in Nigeria. I demolish them and I command that all those who have lifted themselves up in pride and stand against the progress of this nation, who are playing God over this nation. Lord, you said you resist the proud, pull them down. Those two prayers, just pray them. And then if you can pray in tongues, pray. Pray them for five minutes every day. And we'll begin to see changes. Will you do that, people of God? Will you do that? So lift up your hands. And say to after me, say, Father, as your child, I have been called to be a watchman, to be a warrior. I take my place as a watchman or a watchwoman. I receive your equipment. I receive your covering. I declare that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I declare that henceforth I will stand in my place and be a watchman, a watchwoman. I will pray for this nation. I will pray for the world. I will come against in the place of prayers the reasonings, the arguments that are behind every philosophy that is not of God. I will come against the pride of men and women that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of God, that have taken their place, the place of God in the affairs of men. Lord, they shall be brought down. They shall be brought down. As I pray, I will see results. In my own life, there will be elevation. My battles will be fought by you because you have said, the battle is not mine, but yours. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We stand in the place of victory. We declare we are victorious. We will not be consumed in this nation. Thank you, Father. And Lord, right now again, we declare, oh God, peace in the ROCCG. Peace in the household of our general overseer. Comfort to our general overseer and his wife. And comfort to us all. In Jesus' matchless name we have prayed.